So for a quick background, I'm just waking up at almost 2 p.m. I'm the owner of a larger tow company, which has the majority of local police departments' contracts for accidents in pounds. Last night, I was called out at 12.30 a.m. for a rollover one car accident. No big deal, but it was in the county's largest city, about 20 miles from my office and home. I drove out and recovered the vehicle using a flatbed tow truck. Now for the incident. I was driving back from the accident scene with the totaled car on the back of the truck. I was on a two-lane highway, one lane going each direction with double yellow line and center, which has a speed limit of 55. I come across a car going 40 miles per hour and occasionally drifting toward the shoulder or the yellow line. After about five minutes of this, I noticed the person was drinking from a bottle through her rear window due to the height difference of my truck and his car. I immediately pick up my phone and dial the non-emergency dispatch number and explain the situation to them. They start an officer out to intercept the driver, as from my description, she has checked all the boxes for ADUI stop. The officer pulls up behind me while we're going down the road and turns on his red and blues. I flip on my white and yellows as I slow down, signaling the officer to go around as I have no shoulder to go to. As this is happening, the car in front of me immediately slams on his brakes, causing me to lock up my air brakes and just barely miss rear-ending him. The police officer luckily was already in the opposite lane, and by the time he reacted to slow down, he had passed both of us. We are now at about 10 mph, and the officer is leapfrogged to the front of the line. He turns his car at a 45-degree angle and stops, stopping the car dead in its tracks. I stop with my lights on behind him, about two cars back, again at a 45-degree angle to protect everyone from any oncoming traffic as we are now blocking one half of the road. I jumped out and walked around the back of my truck and up the shoulder of the road toward the officer's cruiser. As I'm doing this, I see the driver jump out of her car and start screaming. Our entitled person appears. She's screaming that I'm stalking her and she's scared for her life, calling me pervert and how I followed her from the pub she was at. The officer on scene is the same officer I just spent over an hour with on the road cleaning up the wreck that is still on my truck. Out of pure shock, I responded to the officer saying, you know, there is no way I was anywhere near her, right? Thankfully, he confirmed it wasn't possible. Karen did not like this one bit. She started cussing the officer out and telling him to do his job, that she pays his salary, and she then calls him her servant. At this point, a second officer arrived and parked behind my truck with lights on. I fall back to directing the light traffic that is coming through. As I'm directing traffic, I'm listening to this belligerent Karen insult these officers over and over. Of course, she failed the field sobriety test, and out comes the breathalyzer. She blew a U-12, and as soon as the handcuffs came out, it was like someone lubed Karen up with grease as she was slipping and sliding out of the two officers' hands. Standing there directing traffic, I watch for probably five minutes as they rattle her to the ground and finally get her into cuffs. The officer who had just got my rollover accident from approaches me and asks if I'd like to impound Karen's car too, which I happily accepted and had loaded onto my wheel lift in about two minutes. I was just awoken not too long ago by our Karen asking about her car in my office. One of my dispatchers called to double check there wasn't a hold on the car. It turns out Karen had to wait 60 minutes before we could release her car as all DUI arrests in that county have a mandatory 12-hour impound on the vehicle. I'm sure the girls working my office were thrilled to have the company. So for our honeymoon, we went across a number of European cities I train. The traveling was magical. We did two of the legs on sleepers and enjoyed the traveling as much as the destinations. We have gotten to a routine of sightseeing in the morning, having a lunch somewhere fabulous, going back to our hotel for a little lie down in heat of the afternoon, then out for more sightseeing, evening meals somewhere else fabulous, going for a walk in the evening, having an ice cream, another stroll, then sit in a pavement cafe and have a drink and watch the sunset. Fabulous two weeks. Some of the cities that we visited were very touristy, but some we thought might be a little quieter. What we couldn't do was get away from the British entitled people. Story. Story. We were in Prague. It was magical. Prague at this time was a big destination for hen, stag, and bachelor parties, and we were used to large numbers of drunk Brits embarrassing themselves, but we just ignored them and enjoyed where we were. We had just had dinner in a small restaurant at the side of the castle, a stroll around the castle grounds and an ice cream on the way down. We were intending to sit in the main square with beers and mojitos watching the astronomical clock and the world go by as sunset fell. Seemed like a pretty good plan. As we came down to the Charles Bridge, there were a number of small bars at the bottom of the hill, all of which were in very old, historically important and beautiful buildings. In fact, this particular road and many of the buildings were used in the film Amadeus. The street is narrow, and many of the buildings have steps up to them. It's so narrow that, unlike most of the bars in Prague, there is little or no outside seating. We are nearly at the end of the road, about to go over the Charles Bridge, but the road is blocked by a group of people, one of whom is having an argument with someone from a bar at its entrance. 
The person having the argument is in a wheelchair. The entitled person. Entitled person. You have to let us in. Bar person. No, I don't. It's discrimination. No, it's not. Friend of the entitled person. It is. You have to let disabled people in. Get a ramp now. No, we don't. Yes, you do. Hubby is in facilities management. And he says to me as an aside, it's not discrimination. If they physically can't accommodate them due to the building being historical and they have the right to refuse service to anyone, most of the buildings we were surrounded by would fall under listed buildings, which at this time did not have to provide access. That came in three years later, however. As private businesses, they could refuse entry to anyone they wanted. Bare person. The bar is narrow. We are already full and turning people away. And your wheelchair would block access to the other tables and the exit in case of a fire. Entitled person. That's not fair. It's my right. Their friend. It is. You know, you can't refuse us service. Bring tables out here now. Bare person. We don't have a license for outside and there are ten of you. By this time, there's quite a crowd gathering. The entitled person looks at crowd and speaks to them. It's not fair. It's discrimination. They have to let us in. Someone in the crowd who's obviously not a Brit and is a native Pragaian shouts back, stop being a whiny idiot. They're full. Go someone else? Who said that? It's my right to go in there. At this point, the ever-present police wander up. They were extremely good at quieting down any issues with drunks, mainly the Brits. When we were there, policeman to the bar person, what's the problem? The entitled person tried to answer, and the police just held up their hand to quieten her. We are full. We can't accommodate the wheelchair because of the size of the bar, and we don't have a license for drinking outside. The police officer turning to the entitled person, simple, go elsewhere now. The entitled person and friends mutter, but go wandering off up the hill, which was a mistake because the bars up there were even smaller, and we wander off to go watch the sunset and the clock. About an hour later, as we are indulging in more beers and mojitos, along with some french fries and a Greek salad, the bars in the square are full and people are being turned away, who should appear but the entitled person and her friends again. The friends are looking extremely tired. We can hear that they have been wandering around the small bars and getting turned away for the same reason. They come over to the bar where we are sitting outside. It's completely full. There is a waiter at the entrance to the roped-off seating area, and they are turning people away. Entitled person, I need a ramp to get up. Go get one now. Waiter, we are full. Waiter turns their back to them and ignores them. Friends of the entitled person tell her that they are going back to the hotel to get a drink. As they've been out for two hours and not had one drink because she keeps insisting on going into bars where they can't fit her wheelchair, and now they are back at the first bar they wanted to go to, and it's full, and it's all her fault. Aftermath. I get it. I used to go out drinking with a friend who was on crutches permanently after a car accident 20 years before I met him. It sucks. Disabled access is important, and we used to check up on it before we got to the venue. If a venue is full, we never took it as discrimination. We just knew to get there earlier. And being a brat about it to the bar staff is never right. It's not their fault. It's never their fault. And yes, we saw the group of friends out again over the next few nights, but they were getting to the more accessible bars a lot earlier so they could get in. Some backstory. This story happened about two years ago when I used to work for a big, very well-known shelter that's all about prevention of cruelty to animals. In Florida, mind you, I won't be naming the shelter. In my area for about five years. I love that job so much but had to leave once I moved too far away. However, I do always try to make donations often. During and after that job, I always keep a lead, food, toys, cat carrier, etc. in my car at all times in case I come across a loose animal, even a snake or other non-normal animals. Yes, you'd be surprised how often they can get out too, and I can help contain them while finding the pet parent. It made me realize how many pets actually do get out, and not even at the fault of the pet parents. I also realized just how often people leave their pets in the car for shopping. Most of the time they have the car on with a person inside, but a handful of times. I've had people leaving their car with the windows cracked, so I always inform them about the laws in Florida when leaving pets in the car. You'd be surprised yet not how many people don't know about this law. This was the most extreme I've yet to experience to this day. On to the story. On this day, it was in the 90s, but the temperature felt more in the 100s. Welcome to Florida. I was heading into my local supermarket to get a new case of water after getting off my shift when I spot a small puppy in the back seat of an SUV. The puppy looked to be a pit lab mix and about a few months old, very much tired and panting heavily. There was no one in the car and the windows were open just a crack. I rushed inside to the customer service desk, informed them about the dog, that I would call the cops if it didn't come out soon, and they spoke over the loudspeaker, calling for the owner. The associate gave me a bottle of water to give the pup when we got him out, then went to my car getting the lead, bowl, and toys with keys in hand. 
I carry a device that allows me to punch out the window in emergencies. I also call the police to inform them about the dog in Florida. If it's to save an animal, you have to call the police. Then you can do what's necessary to get the dog out of the car safely. And told them if the owner still hasn't come out, then I was going to punch out the window, which they gave the approval for and asked I stay on the phone for when it happens. A crowd had already started to gather, all concerned about the puppy. After another eight minutes, I had enough told the operator I was punching out the window and handed my phone to a passerby. I went to the front passenger window. Puppy was in the back driver's side. Used the device to punch out the window. I crawled in. Thankful I had my long pants on and cleaning boots. Unlocked the door as another person opened the door, grabbing the dog. The dog was clearly in heavy distress, so we brought him into my already cold air-conditioned car. I was helping him drink water as the cops pulled up. Another five minutes later, the entitled mother and her child in tow came out with a cart of groceries. As soon as she sees the busted window, she freaks out screaming and yelling about her property being damaged and says, I'll sue. The cops go to her, trying to calm her down and explaining how the dog was in distress and needed to be removed from the car. That's ridiculous. We were only in there for 15 minutes and the puppy was fine. We need to go home now, so give us back the dog. I was pissed to hear this. Are you stupid? In 15 minutes, the inside of a car at this temperature can get to 115 degrees F about 45-50 degrees CE, which can kill any animal and any kid. It's like a damn oven. I'm taking this dog to the vet. She was shocked that someone dared to talk back to her and the kid started crying, pointing at me as I settled the dog into the front seat. About, why is this strange lady taking Rusty? The woman started making her way to me, but the hop stepped in the way. Who do you think you are? You're stealing my dog, you brat. You can't let her get away with this. Censored. Censored. One of the officers got behind her and cuffed her hands, explaining her rights to her while another was on the phone next to the crying kid. The dad later came to pick him up from what I heard. I turned as I went to the driver's side of the car and turned my back to her, showing the big well-known shelter staff logo in big letter letters across my back and got in taking the dog to the local vet. Thankfully, Rusty was fine, heavily dehydrated, but if I hadn't done what I did, he would have had bad internal damage or possibly died. The mom was arrested for animal cruelty and the judge awarded the dog to my shelter the mom being registered to not have any other animals in her care or anyone else who lived with her. Apparently, this was the last straw for the court, as she already had a case against her for abusing another dog before Rusty. Rusty, now named Percy, made a full recovery and was adopted by a wonderful family with two kids who had another dog in their home named Broco. They got along as thick as thieves. It was hard to see him go, and I would have adopted him myself, but my apartment at the time didn't allow pets. I was just happy to see him off to his new life. I do feel bad for the kid. He was probably like five and didn't understand what was happening at the time, but I have no sympathy for that mom at all. It's a long story, but bear with me. We currently live in Ukraine, where me and my sister were born. In 1995, when our country was still a mess from the collapse of Soviet Union and the crime rate was still sky high, my mother got assaulted when she returned from work and, as a result, got pregnant with Allie. She basically had no means of getting an abortion because she barely had enough money to even feed herself, thanks to the collapse of our economy. Giving the child up for adoption was also out of the question, because any orphanage would just refuse taking your child in. So when Allie was born in 1996, she had to keep her. You probably already get where this is going? Yes, my mother had always resented Allie, either because she never wanted her, because she reminded her about what happened to her, or all of the above. I don't really know her exact reasoning behind that, nor do I care about it. Three years later, she had met my biological father, and I was born and had basically become the epitome of a golden child. My mother had spent time with me. She had bought me everything I wanted. She even had taught me how to read and use the computer at the age of four. When I went to school, I was at the top of my class up to the fifth grade, thanks to all the time that my mother had spent with me. And then there was Allie, wearing cheapest and the most ragged clothes you could ever find, not even knowing the taste of ice cream up until the age of 12, not being allowed to spend time outside at all, and constantly being grounded for lacking in education. My mother has always avoided talking with me about my sister. Whenever I asked her anything about her, she would just quickly change topic or even specifically tell me, and I quote, not to worry about her. Well, thanks to the fact that when I was a child, my attention span was extremely short, simply distracting me from what bothers me usually worked and the topic of my sister was no exception. Needless to say, when I tried talking to Allie directly, she had simply ignored me or straight out told me to get lost because she hated me and I can definitely imagine why. The first time that we actually shared more than a few words with each other was when her classmate had tried to bully her for how she dressed, and let's just say that she didn't let it slide. I witnessed it, and so did one of the teachers. So when my mother was called to the principal's office, 
A few of her other classmates even said, Teacher and I gave our side of the story saying that Allie had been provoked by this kid and that he had a reputation for being a jerk towards those who were weaker than him. Unfortunately for him, though, this time he had picked the wrong target. My mother had none of it, and this time she decided that simply grounding her again isn't enough. So instead, she had asked the principal to return my sister's documents because my mother was going to send Allie to a special school where the students are living on the premise of the facility and are only allowed to leave it for the winter and summer breaks because she didn't raise a criminal. The principal had tried to tell her that it was a little too extreme and even sided with Allie, stating that other than her grades, that was the first time she had ever gotten trouble in this school. So there was no need for such drastic measures, but this time I had enough. I interrupted our principal and it was the first time in my life when I confronted my mother and raised my voice. I told her everything I thought about how she treated Allie, how she never explained to me, why should I not worry about her, how she completely ignored what literally everyone in the principal's office was telling her that it wasn't even her fault. Basically, I caused a scene for everyone in this room to see, berated and humiliated my mother and ran off, shutting the door behind me. My mother, of course, followed me and tried to calm me down, as if it was about me again. I simply told her that if she is to follow through with her threats of sending my sister to that awful place, she might as well send me after her because if she won't, I'll do everything in my power to get expelled from every single school she will send me to after this one. When we got home, Allie walked up to me and berated me for sticking my nose where it doesn't belong, yelling at my mother in front of entire school and pretending that I care about her, when in reality, I just don't want to spoil my perfect record with a sister being sent to a special school. She had only stopped this rant when her mother came in to see what all the commotion was about and stormed off to her room. I don't know where Allie got all of this from, but what was odd is that I was actually happy. It was the first time when she actually talked to me, and despite her being so mad and angry at me for what I did, I actually felt relieved. From that point on, I knew that there is a reason as to why she ignores me, and I spent the few following months trying to figure out what it was, trying to talk to her. At first, she kept ignoring me, brushing me off, or even getting angry at me. I gave it a rest for a few days and then tried again and again and again and again and again. Eventually, she started to answer my questions, one or few at a time, but that was the start. When I got enough information, I asked her to talk about all of this. It took a few months, but I really wanted to figure out why we don't get along and if that's possible, change it. Finally, the time has come. Our mother was away and Allie had finally agreed to talk to me. The entire conversation wasn't too pleasant because throughout most of it, I had to defend myself from baseless accusations from Ally, but closer to the end, she actually started to see my side of things, and I found out that I was actually wrong about the way my mother treated her, because turned out, I haven't seen even half of it. Allie even said sorry for projecting her feelings about our mother on me, but at that point, I kind of get why she would do that. If I were in her place, I'd probably hate her too. Unfortunately, we didn't suddenly become best friends after that conversation, and Allie still kept her distance from me, but that was the start. Sometimes we even got along when it turned out that we both liked the same music and movies. Throughout the following couple of years, the distance between us became shorter and shorter. When she turned 15, she went to college, and despite it being in the same city that we lived in, she still chose to rent a room. You can probably see why. We still kept in touch, but as the time went on, we started talking less and less, especially considering that after finishing school, I also moved to the other side of our country to attend university. During the time we haven't been in touch, Allie started doing drugs, and one time she got overdosed. She made it, and once I heard about it from our uncle, who had actually loved both his nieces, I dropped everything and moved back to my hometown and spent two following weeks at the hospital with her. There were four people there, Allie, me, our uncle, and her ex-boyfriend with whom we haven't talked for about seven years. Not only did our mother never show up to check on her daughter, but when she called me, instead of asking whether or not Allie is alive, she had the audacity to ask me well. If you're already in our city, when will you visit me? That was the last straw for me. I never even told her anything. Just blocked her number and went no contact. Once my sister got back on her feet, we moved back to the city where my university is and we still live together while she fights with her addiction. So far, she has been sober for a year, found a job, and visits the gym every day. Why do women with kids feel so entitled just because they have kids? I, a 30-year-old female, have an autoimmune arthritis condition. I walk with cane. On my bad days, I can barely walk at all. I have a handicap placard for those days. I had to go grocery shopping a while ago, and I was in no condition to be walking a long way. Not a code red pain day, but definitely up there. If I hadn't been completely out of a few major necessities, I wouldn't have been out at all. When I got there, all the handicap spots were full. But I saw an older gentleman loading his trunk and knew that spot would soon be available. 
So I pulled up and put on my blinker and waited. Soon as he was gone, I pulled into the spot, threw up my blue placard and began hauling myself out of the car. I'm just about ready to close the door when I hear, Excuse me. I look over and see a teal subby pulled up behind me. There's this woman in the driver's seat yelling out the open passenger window at me. Entitled Mother, you just took my spot. Me? What? I was waiting behind the other guy. I didn't see you? No. No. These are handicap spots. They're only for handicap people. I am literally leaning against my car, cane in hand. I hold up the cane. I am handicapped, Mom. I have a permit. She scoffs and pulls away. I decide to just forget about her and begin my hobble walk into the store. I got even more frustrated when I saw there were no electric carts available. So I was forced to grab one of the smaller trolleys and walk. Since I have a hard time pushing a cart one-handed and the cart offers some support, I put my cane inside the cart. I was only as far as the produce section when I heard a familiar voice. Hey, you! It's the entitled mother. She's pushing one of those big carts that look like cars for the kids. She had an infant and a toddler strapped into the front of the cart. Another two-year-old kid standing, bouncing, in the cart. And yet another child holding her hand walking beside her. (laughs) He looked five-ish. I'm bad at telling ages. She is also very pregnant. She stalks up to me with this pissed-off expression. You, you need to learn to be more respectful. I was waiting for that parking spot. And you stole it. She's talking, slash, yelling over her kids, who are all fussing loudly. Me, lady, I didn't see you waiting for that spot. If you were, I apologize. Entitled mother. I was waiting for it. I needed a spot close to the entrance. Because of you, I had to park all the way toward the back. Well, I said I was sorry. I look over her and her brood real quick. Besides, that was a handicapped spot. You can only park there with a permit. Are one of your kids handicapped? No. No. The spot was for me. I'm pregnant. Lady. Lady. You can't use disabled parking just because you're pregnant. Not unless you have some complications that affect your mobility. No. You can use them if you're pregnant, too. I always use them. I don't think that's how it's supposed to work, ma'am. You're lucky you haven't gotten a ticket for not having a permit displayed. She huffs. Well, you shouldn't be using it. You're not pregnant and you clearly don't have kids. No, no, I'm not pregnant, but I'm disabled. This whole conversation, I've been leaning on my cart for support. I pull my cane out for her to see. I can barely walk 10 feet without pain. That's why I have a handicap permit. That's no excuse. You can't be in that much pain. I've been up all night with a colicky baby and couldn't keep anything down because of morning sickness. I'm exhausted. You don't know what it's like wrangling for a kid while pregnant. I clearly needed that spot more than you did. I am more than done with this whole argument at this point. Look, lady. I'm in pain. I'm tired. And I want to just finish my shopping so I can go home and try to work up the will to make dinner tonight. I didn't see you waiting for the damn parking spot. And you shouldn't be using it without a permit anyway. Good day. I tried walking away. You selfish brat. You don't know what tired is. I'm going to report you to store security. I'll get them to tow your car. Lady, call security if you want. I'm allowed to park there. I didn't choose to become disabled, but you chose to have kids. It's not my fault you're tired and run down and can't be bothered to walk the extra 200 feet to the door. It's not my fault you chose to get pregnant. You deal with your life. I'll deal with mine. I hobbled off to try to finish my shopping, ignoring her parting comments. That fight gave me just enough adrenaline to get through my trip without falling apart. I had an assistant help load my vehicle, which was undisturbed where I had parked it. I was still pissed when I got home, but it was nothing a long soak in the tub couldn't fix. I still hope she gets ticketed for parking in the handicap spots, but as long as I never see her again, I'll be happy. Some background information. I am immunocompromised due to childhood abuse neglect. I currently wear my mask whenever I'm not at home, whether I'm inside or out. My back was broken several years ago during an assault. The doctors told me I would never walk again, especially seeing I was a bit overweight and probably wouldn't stick with the rehab. It was almost two years until I could walk unassisted, but the bone chip in my back can still sometimes shift and bump a nerve, causing my muscles to lock up or go weak to the point I collapse. Because of this, I carry a carved wooden walking stick nearly as tall as me. I, female, 45, was waiting outside the clinic after a doctor's appointment looking for some new ebooks on my phone while Dan, my partner, male 49, went to get the car from the other side of the building. Enter the entitled man. You need to take your mask off. You are scaring my children. Excuse me, I'm talking to you. I glance up at him, and then his two kids staring at their dad with wide eyes. I'm sorry, 
but I can't do that. I need to wear this mask because of a health condition. You're lying. You're just trying to cause trouble. He looks me up and down, probably taking in my rainbow hair, jewelry, dark purple hoodie, red and black gypsy skirt, purple and black boots, and anything else he deems inappropriate. You. I mean, just look at you seeking attention you don't deserve. You're entitled to your opinion, but I'm still not taking my mask off. And I'm not scaring those kids. You are. There's no reason to be afraid of someone else wearing a mask. If they are, it's because your behavior made them think they should be. You can't speak to me that way. Do you not realize who I am? Nope. Nope. Do you not realize I'm standing two feet from the door of a medical facility? One you're about to enter? Do you not realize it's a place you're required to wear masks? He keeps going on and on, getting louder and louder, but I'm finished with him. So I just tune him out and continue looking for books. This probably made him more angry, but engaging in debates with idiots is both pointless and exhausting. Dan pulls up and gets out just in time to see this man get in my face and scream, you're going to die a miserable death anyway, so why wear a mask? Now, Dan knows I can take care of myself, so he's just casually leaning against the car, but still close enough to jump in if necessary. Then the man makes the move I figure someone like him might end up doing. He grabs for my mask. I turn as if he was throwing a punch, spin my stick behind him, nailing him in the hamstrings back of the thigh, and take three steps to the side. He drops and starts crying as if he's dying. Dan just throws his head back and laughs so hard he's practically convulsing. He does manage to rein it enough to walk inside and let staff member know what happened. While I'm waiting, I sit on a bench near the kids and quickly explain that violence should only be used if someone's trying to physically hurt you or someone you don't know tries to touch you. And if that ever happens, no matter who did it, you need to tell an adult who wasn't there and doesn't already know what happened. Then I point to their dad and tell them he tried to touch me and I don't know him. I had to use violence to stop him, and even though a lot of people saw it, I will still tell someone else. Dan, a nurse, and another staff member pushing a wheelchair come out and head our way. After making sure they knew who we were, Dan, who had started shaking with laughter as soon as he saw the man again, just took my hand and we started walking toward our car. As I pass the man, I bend over slightly and whisper coward, yeah, not one of my most mature moments, but not one of the worst either. Before anyone asks, which a couple of the people I've told have that stick is always in reach. I'm constantly toying with it and practicing the self-defense moves I've learned in the years since the assault. I know the right amount of force that causes severe damage. I did not use it. The guy was an idiot jerk, but his action didn't warrant more. Plus, his already upset kids were right there. 